The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, its purpose is to study outbreaks of diseases that occur, occur within the United States and its territories to institute uh, uh, preventions for those diseases. When the outbreak of AIDS occurred, it was an unusual disease and very puzzling because no one had really seen that type of infectious disease before. I received a call from a physician from South Florida who wanted to report to me that he had a patient with hemophilia that had developed pneumocystis carinii pneumonia, which was one of the major presentations for many of the patients that had AIDS at the time. I am a hematologist and I had treated patients both at, at Hopkins and, in, and at Emory University uh, with hemophilia for a number of years, and I'd never seen a patient with hemophilia that had pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. So I thought that if, if patients with hemophilia were coming down with this disease, that it m was most likely would be an infectious agent that was being transmitted uh, through blood and blood products. Hemophilia patients receive clotting factor. Now, clotting factor is manufactured from the donations of up to 20,000 individual donations so that an infection in any one of those 20,000 donations that goes into a pool could perhaps transmit uh, hepatitis or other bloodborne diseases. It uh, was not unusual that if a new bloodborne disease uh, occurred, the patients with hemophilia would be a, a so-called canary in a coal mine. End of July in 1982, we had identified three patients with hemophilia who had developed AIDS. These three patients convinced us at that point in time that AIDS was probably an infectious agent, probably transmitted by blood. The director of the CDC thought this was critically important and called together a meeting in Washington at the Secretary of Health's office of blood bankers and leaders of the various users of blood products, such as the National Hemophilia Foundation, the manufacturers of plasma and plasma products, and of the gay populations uh, organizations. The issue was not received well, and the suggestion that it was a bloodborne infection was not received very well on the basis of three patients. The blood banks themselves did not want to spend a lot of money changing their procedures. They loved the homosexual population because they were excellent blood donors and they did not want to uh, lose that population. The gays were uh, not interested at all in us blaming them for uh, the um, occurrence of uh, the, a new agent that might uh, be contaminating the blood supply. And the uh, manufacturers were very, very upset over that possibility because they knew that they would be subject to product liability. And the hemophilia population were not anxious to hear that type of information because the concentrates they were using was a life-saving medication that had transformed their lives. And it was critical that, that, uh, that if it were a contaminated uh, product, that that meant they would have to go back to a period of time when when life expectancies were as low as in the mid-30s. So that, that all of these individuals were not interested in hearing this kind of information and suggested that we uh, collect more data. We began collecting more patients with hemophilia and we began looking for blood transfusion patients that had developed AIDS this was difficult because the blood banks were very reluctant to share any kind of donation donor list because they did not want us tracking down donors and asking them if they were belonged to one of the high risk groups. And so we had to do this very carefully. 
Finally, we identified a clear-cut case in the end of 1982 that was in a small child who developed AIDS following a blood transfusion. On January the 4th in 1983, we called a meeting in Atlanta because by that time we had about eight cases with hemophilia who had developed AIDS and we had one clear transfusion cases. And so we called all of these individuals back together, members of the gay community, representatives from the blood banking groups, members from, representatives from the hemophilia uh, community, uh, the federal agencies uh, such as the FDA and the NIH, as well as uh, representatives from the manufacturers of plasma and plasma products. And so we thought that this would be, we would all discuss this and make some decisions about what kind of preventions could be used for preventing further spread uh, in the blood supply. I realized at this time that we did, had not identified an aid, AIDS agent, and we did not really prove it uh, that it was causing it. This was just the patterns that we were seeing. We thought that this was common sense, but we were met with a wall of resistance. And so uh, people thought that the CDC's investigators were non-scientific and that, uh, that all of this did not indicate they should change blood banking practices at all. And it was a very discouraging day for us in January of 1983. The only people that began listening to us in any earnest at that point in time was a marked concern among the hemophilia community. They went to the manufacturers shortly thereafter and, and suggested that high-risk groups for, for blood-borne infections be excluded from, from donating blood that went into the manufacture of uh, plasma products, such as the clotting factor. And some of the manufacturers agreed to do this. But about 20% of the blood came from voluntary donors, which the blood banks refused to do this kind of screening and testing. And so that, uh, that you still had a substantial amount of blood that went into these tremendous pools that could have been infected with any agent that caused AIDS at the time. Heat-treated factor had been induced in mid-1983 by a company called Baxter. But Baxter charged so much for the, the product that nobody bought it. And so I went to, the, to Steve McDougall, who headed my, my immunology laboratory, and I said, Steve, let's heat some of this virus and see how sensitive it is, and if it's sensitive, then that might be a way to stop the epidemic among patients in hemophilia. So Steve said, sure. He performed those assays very quickly, and uh, it was incredibly sensitive to heat. So Alan Brownstein uh, called the members of the four manufacturers together, and we had lunch in Rio. And at the lunch, I asked him, would they be willing to put the virus through their inactivation processes because by that time they had all developed heat-treated uh, processes. And they, two, of the, two of the manufacturers agreed. We performed the experiments and it showed the same kind of results that we had achieved in our laboratory at CDC. I presented that to the National Hemophilia Foundation and they immediately recommended the use of heat treatment. And so that by the end of 1984. That was almost universally accepted everywhere, and so the switch to heat treatment uh, essentially stopped the epidemic. We went back later, years later, and looked at people born in each year, 1984, 85, 86, and 87, and people born after 1984, none of them were infected with the HIV virus. The test was subsequently introduced in uh, uh, 1985, but by that time the epidemic had already stopped in patients with hemophilia. Some of the products were unfortunately exported to other countries. One of the processes was a process that did not completely inactivate, even though it was heat treated, 
and there were products left over. The Canadian outbreak was made because of a product that was uh, heat treated but by a lesser method. Subsequently, a small epidemic occurred several years later in, in the Canadian hemophilia population from that type of material. The number of individuals with hemophilia that were infected are difficult to obtain because so many people died in those early years that by the time we could measure the, the prevalence or the number of patients infected, uh, there were a number that were already deaths. Our best estimates are that probably 50 to 60 percent of the population were infected with HIV uh, during those critical years. The exact number could never really be established for certain.